Good afternoon for those of you east on the East Coast. Uh, good morning to those on the West Coast of the US and a good day to everyone around the world in our TFAS alumni group that is joining us today. Uh, I also wanna welcome our students in our virtual program who are also participating in this webinar. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here today with you. Uh, we're gonna hear from uh, George and Sally Meyer Fellow, Ann Bradley, and our, she is also our academic director at TFAS. Uh, she does many things for us, including advise us on curriculum, uh, teach courses at the college and high school level for TFAS, and uh, travel the country speaking and, and writing op-eds and doing other things to help us in our mission of educa economic education. Uh, I would like to, before turning things over to Professor Bradley, just mention that this is an outstanding summer we have underway at TFAS as always. We have uh, well over 1,400 students attending in-person programs in Washington, D.C. with our students, programs for college students and law students. Uh, we're doing 21 programs for high school students on college campuses throughout the U.S. as well as virtually. And we will be holding international programs in July in Prague and in Guatemala. So it's uh, busy as ever here at TFAS as we pursue our mission of developing courageous leaders who can make the world a better place. Uh, I also just wanna mention, we have a new Liberty and Leadership podcast that I host each week with a courageous, successful TFAS alum. Uh, there's no shortage of those. I've interviewed four so far and we've released those. You can follow them on uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you download podcasts. So join me uh, and listen in on uh, examples of courageous leadership among TFAS alums who are making the world a better place. Well, today, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Professor Ann Rathbone Bradley. Uh, she'll be talking on the economics of terrorism. Uh, she has her PhD from George Mason University. Uh, she's been teaching in many different capacities in addition to TFAS at the Institute of World Politics uh, at Grove City College, uh, writing and teaching for the Institute for Faith, Work and Economics. So uh, she never rests uh, in her work to try to spread the economic way of thinking. And today she'll tell us how she applies it to an analysis of terrorism. So without further ado, please welcome Ann Bradley. Ann. Thank you so yours. much. Thank you so much, Roger. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm just gonna real quickly share my screen. Um, and as, as Roger mentioned, let's see, there we go. Um, and I'm going to be very dedicated to um, constraining myself to the time that I've been given. So I have a little, um, stopwatch here so we can make sure we have time for questions. So welcome to all of you, um, both virtual students and alumni, board members, and uh, friends of TFAS. Uh, I think that economics is really exciting. Um, obviously, I'm biased. I'm an economist, um, and this is what I do. But I think that this example that I just quickly will run through with you today has been a research program of mine for really 20 years. And I think it um, shows the power of what we call at TFAS, the economic way of thinking. And so I think terrorism is, is an issue in and of itself that we don't think economists should be brought into um, that conversation. So we think a lot about um, people at the Pentagon and people in the military, people that are working on foreign policy, lots of uh, politicians, lots of different um, government agencies, but you know, I think that economists really have something unique to offer here. And so this is 9-11 um, happened when I was in graduate school. At the time, my professor, um, who was Charles Rowley, he uh, invited me to co-author a paper with him, which by the way, when you're in graduate school, that's kind of a gift. Um, and so I said, yes, I didn't before that ever think to write on terrorism. And I've been doing it ever since. Um, and this, what you're seeing today is starts with my dissertation project. Um, I'm going to give an example today of Al-Qaeda, um, but I think that we can really apply this type of analysis to any uh, terrorist group, uh, and I think uh, lots of economists are doing this in the post-9-11 
uh, 9-11 era. So I think that's a good thing. But what I want to say is, I think my my slides are, sorry, in reverse order. But I think what we have to do is start here with what does economics tell us about human action? And so this is just a very um, simple summary of how economists think about the human action model. And it, it basically um, comes from an Austrian economist, Ludwig von Mises, in his book, Human Action. He spends the first third of that book really trying to understand how and why people make choices. How do you go from a state of inaction, I'm not making a choice, to deciding that you're going to do something? And so kind of the summary here is that these three things must be present for an individual to decide that they're going to, they're going to just do something. And so the first is experiencing a state of uneasiness. We're uneasy with our current situation, with our current state of affairs. And then number two is we have a vision for a better outcome. So we can imagine a world where the uneasiness is somewhat relieved. It doesn't mean it's permanently relieved or it's fully relieved to our satisfaction, but it's there's a better outcome. So economists always think about on the margin, how do we make marginal improvements? And then number three, our assumption as economists is that human beings take conscious and purposeful steps to make those choices. Now, this does not mean that human beings are always um, ethical or righteous, and we don't even assume that they have all the information that they need. And so you can imagine yourself in the grocery store or imagine yourself shopping online in your Amazon cart. You don't have kind of this um, robotic spreadsheet in your mind, which tells you about all the things that are available and, and what your choices are going to be given your budget. But given what you do know and the preferences that you do have, you kind of calculate within that range. So we don't have to assume that people have are perfectly informed, but what we are assuming is that all human beings are conscious and purposeful, and this applies to behavior that we deplore, that we want to stop, like terrorist activity, like criminal activity. And so this is a really important assumption for economists. And I actually think it's the reason that economists should be brought to the table, because what it means is that people respond to incentives. So having a level of uneasiness, and then having a vision, and then making a choice to do something about it, means that there's a possibility that people might choose other things, right? If they're given different options, if they're given different opportunities, if they have more knowledge, but sometimes it's about preferences changing. And so it gives us hope that incentives apply to human behavior. And as such, those incentives could potentially be altered. And so that's what I wanted to do when I started thinking about what we are calling today kind of the political economy of terrorism, because I don't think terrorism is just about economics. I think economics lens shines light on this really big problem that we face in the world today. Um, it's not a new problem, by the way. Terrorism has in some way, shape or form always been with us, uh, but there's kind of modern innovations in terrorism that are very troubling. And we want to extend human flourishing, to advance human flourishing. And so, um, you know, eliminating terrorism to the extent that we can is really an important part of that calculus. And so the first thing I wanted to understand as an economist is just thinking about terrorism along a supply and demand curve. And when I start talking about this, this is always, I think, strikes people as, huh, I never really thought of that before. Terrorism doesn't operate in an above ground market. Um, it's not the same thing as shopping on Amazon. It's not the same thing as going into your favorite ice cream shop. Um, where you have a list of ice cream flavors and different types of cones and all these things, and you pick what you want, and then there's a price for it, and you walk out with your ice cream, and the shop owner has your money, and kind of this is a voluntary exchange, and both parties are better off. So it's not that simple, but there is this demand for terrorism that I really wanted to understand, and I also wanted to think um, and kind of really borrowing from economist F.A. Hayek here, as terrorism as an emergent order. It is something that evolves or emerges out of a certain set of circumstances. And it's obvious to us that in some countries in the world, terrorism, homegrown kind of terrorism, or um, terrorism shelters, right, safe havens for terrorism, are much more likely in some countries than others. That seems obvious to us, but I think the economist then start to asking questions about, well, why, right? What, what is it? Is it just about being rich? Is it just about having a good government? Is it about being poor? Is it about a certain religion? We want to know the why. 
But we can't do that without thinking about the question of why do some people demand terrorism? And I will say one of the most fundamental lessons in all of economics is that supply is demand in disguise. And what I mean by that is people supply things, usually through firms, but also through nonprofit organizations and things like this. They supply things because they think people want them. So think about you know, um, Walmart or Target or the grocery store or, you know, something like this, the ice cream shop I mentioned, the ice cream shop wants to have the flavors that you want. They don't know you. And so they don't know exactly what you want. So they have a variety of flavors and they're managing costs, inventory against what they perceive to be as the, the dominant preferences of a lot of consumers, right? So there's always mint chocolate chip. There's always strawberry, vanilla and chocolate because those are ice cream flavors that people like. But they wouldn't supply them if people stopped choosing those flavors. This is true for terrorism, especially large, well-financed, well-functioning terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda or ISIS, right? So these are, these are terrorists with a lot of resources, and it takes a lot of energy, time to accumulate those resources for the terrorists and to manage them in explicit ways. And so supply and demand are both relevant here. And I wanted to really think about that. Now, this is not as easy to figure out as kind of trying to figure out how many ice cream flavors are in an ice cream shop, right? Because we're talking about covert activity. It often happens out of our line of sight, um, which is why the intelligence community exists, right? Because they're trying to ascertain what terrorists are up to next because they want to intercept them. But I think at the end of the day, maybe I'm giving away the end a little bit here, but I think at the end of the day, we can intercept forever, right? We could intercept and intercept and intercept, and we can and, and do need to do that. But fighting terrorism is about more than that. It's about changing the institutional environment in which terrorists live. And some of that is not just as simple as, you know, the U.S. makes a policy and then enacts it. Sometimes this emergent order towards liberty, away from terrorism, away from plunder, away from violence, has to come from within these countries. But we can't understand how to get there if we don't use kind of some basic principles of economics, right? So at the end of the day, terrorists aren't going to keep putting their lives and their money on the line if it's fruitless. Um, so supply is a response to demand. And so in my view, as a young economist starting to study this, I thought, well, gosh, lots of policy is focused on the supply curve, right? Stopping terrorism in its tracks. That's necessary. But like I said, it's insufficient, right? We can intercept all day. What we need to do is think about why people do it in the first place and think about what the alternative set of institutions needs to look like so that people choose terrorism less. Well, it turns out this is extremely difficult to do. And you know, I'm just kind of speaking from the US context here, but even defining terrorism, which would be important for the US government to do, as well as international uh, allies and institutions and um, other governments is a very hard thing to do. So the UN doesn't even have a an agreed upon definition of terrorism. The reason this is a problem is because it's hard to fight it. It's hard to deploy resources against it. And we're disagreeing about what it is and what it looks like. And there's a danger in having too broad of a definition. We can't say everything we don't like is terrorism. So there is a real necessity for precision, but this is hard to do. Um, so I want a few things that, you know, I think are important to understand is there's just not one cause of terrorism. Um, it's not just one thing like poverty um, or lack of education or, you know, terrorism comes from the Middle East. No, that we know that's not true. Now, terrorism has pockets in places of the world um, that are more active than other places. So that's an important thing to know. But you know, my thought was we have to dig down into these institutions to try to understand why people are choosing to do this. So the way to think about this, I think, is, OK, people are responding to what they think is going to be effective. So the terrorist is going to join the terrorist organization, and, and that's maybe a recruit, which would be different than a terrorist leader. But they all have their reasons, right? That kind of human action model applies to them. So we want to figure out what are their perceptions? of the world around them? What do they perceive their threats to be? What are they advocating for? What do they want? This is even hard to figure out. And Al-Qaeda led by bin Laden, I mean, he talked all the time, which was great for the intelligence community because he was always issuing very long statements. Um, and some of that is hyperbolic, right? He wants to rally his supporters, but 
you know, kind of sometimes we're required to read between the lines. So understanding what they want and the institutional environment in which they emerge from is going to be really important. And this is why I think applying these principles is very effective. But just to understand different terrorist groups, we have to do individual case studies of groups across the world, right? Using these principles to drill down deep. And there's many working definitions of terrorism, even within the U.S. government. So the Federal Criminal Code has one, the Patriot Act, the FBI, the U.S. Army Manual, and the Department of Defense. And they're all a little bit different. Lots of them kind of come down or, or boil down to the idea that terrorists are, act, are activated or motivated by some sort of social change, which I think is right. Um, and this can manifest itself in different ways. They might want religious institutional change, government change, um, legal change, cultural change, certainly. And so that, you know, kind of, again, we have to kind of drill down and say what, what's motivating them in the space or in the place where they find themselves? What are they advocating for? So I just want to very briefly, I probably have way too much more than I can do, but I want to try to give you a, a little sketch of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda goes way back. Um, we could take it even back farther than 1979, uh, because in the post-World War II era, um, there's a lot that's going on, both politically and economically. So there's lots of economic growth, which means there's an increased demand for oil. As people get richer, they demand more oil, and oil is a very politicized good. So there's lots going on at the time. But I think in particular, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which lasts from 1979 to 1989, um, is a, a turning point for al-Qaeda specifically. Um, <clears throat> the CIA had a program called Operation Cyclone, uh, in which the U.S. government supported um, and channeled funds through Pakistan's intelligence agency to the Afghan Mujahideen who were fighting the Soviets. So obviously at the time, the world was very worried, rightly so, about the expansion of the Soviet empire into countries like Afghanistan. And bin Laden found himself um, you know, on the ground fighting the Soviets. So he was not a communist. He was not a Marxist. He, he was um, fighting for Afghanistan against the Soviets. So he gets caught up in this as a young person. This here is a picture of um, President Reagan. And he's, you know, kind of, this is kind of one of the meetings where, you know, Operation Cyclone and, and all the kind of activities that are around that um, are being agreed upon. So this was, some of it obviously was covert, some of it was known. And Al Qaeda was started by three people. Right. I mean, this is a it started small, just like if you think of the trillion dollar American corporations today, which are nothing like terrorist groups. Right. They do good. Um, terrorist groups do harm. Uh, started, you know, with a few ideas from a few people. And these three people led Al Qaeda in a very top to bottom, top down, militaristic type of small organization. Um, this bottom picture here is a picture of bin Laden. And he's photographed with a Pakistani journalist. Behind him is a Russian um, assault rifle. And that is something that was captured from the, the Soviets. So there's very proud of that. So bin Laden was a spokesman. He was extremely charismatic. Um, and he was in that regard, a cult of personality for his organization. This is really important for the early days of Al Qaeda, which was founded in 1988, because he, you think about starting a new organization that's not a firm. It's not for profit, right? You can't call up Al Qaeda and place an order for a terrorist attack, and then you get kind of a receipt and you go home, right? So it's not a, um, a, a typical market interaction. Um, but his his goals and desires are executed by the organization, right? So he has to do a lot of things that firms do, and so I use the theory of the firm to try to help me understand how Al Qaeda was able to do such radical and volatile and dangerous and horrible things and keep you know, a tight knit organization together, which is very challenging. Um, and so uh, it's remarkable that he was able to do that. And I think his cult of personality really went a long way to him providing some cohesiveness to the organization. There's a theory in political, um, you know, public choice by Mansur Olson and you know, it's this idea of kind of states as roving or stationary bandits. So I took that theory from um, that thinking from Mansur Olson, and I tried to apply it to Al Qaeda. And I think again, you could do this for any terrorist group. And the point is to try to understand again why are they doing the things that they're doing? 
So if you look at the movement of, of, of Al Qaeda over time, they start in Saudi Arabia. This is, of course, no accident. The picture at the bottom is their flag, right? So they do all the marketing. They have a flag, they have an organizational name, they have a budget, they have leaders, and then they start to get donors, which I'll talk about in a minute. And their home base is Saudi Arabia. Again, not a coincidence because bin Laden himself is from a very wealthy billionaire family in Saudi Arabia. They get kicked out of Saudi Arabia and they move to the Sudan and they operate there. And then they get kicked out based on international pressure of the Sudan and they end up in Afghanistan. So this is kind of my view on this. Again, not I don't have any access to intelligence documents to confirm whether I'm right or not, but just applying the theory to what they're doing. Um, I think that my take on this is that they probably wanted to be a stationary bandit. So a stationary bandit stays and they pillage. They use the local resources for their benefit, for what they want. But the problem with that is that you can always face being overturned, overthrown, coups, revolutions, right? And so some kind of thugs, right, or plunderers choose to be stationary bandits, but it requires a lot of force. Some plunderers choose to be roving bandits, which means it's like a, a moving criminal gang, right? You go to an area, you extract, 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 you use force, and then you move on, right? Because if you move on, then you're less likely to be caught. I think bin Laden always wanted to stay with Saudi Arabia. I think if you listen to some of his talks at the early days, what he was really upset about was US involvement in Saudi Arabian affairs. So I think he had some kind of, um, pride in, in where he was from and wanted to stay there. But I think international pressure made a move. And so this cost the terrorist group something, right? Because then they have to kind of start all over and start all over and start all over. And so in the early days of Al Qaeda, they're training, they're equipping. And then this culminates in the 9-11 attacks. And, and we all know this story. I was in graduate school at the time, actually getting ready for a class that morning. And my class was canceled. All classes at George Mason canceled for a week. And we all know what happened with many, many thousands of people that died on that day. And this unleashed kind of the modern war on terrorism. And the terrorists, if you read the 9-11 Commission report, it's very telling about their thought process. This picture here <clears throat> is KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. He's the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks and he reported to the leadership of Al Qaeda. His vision was for a much bigger attack. He wanted to buy by global, if that's a word, um, attacks on the East Coast of the United States and on Japan that were simultaneous. And that was shot down by the leadership. And the reason it was shot down is because the more you do as a terrorist organization, the more easy it is to intercept, right? So if, if your task is too complex, requires too many things going on at the same time, then the people that want to shut you down are going to move into action and be able to do that. So it's better to be small and effective than big and ineffective because what the terrorist always wants is to succeed in their goals. And when they fail publicly, they lose credibility and they lose donors. So they're always about optimizing results, always. They had targets. And even in 9-11, they didn't accomplish exactly what they wanted. Again, if you read the details of these KSM detainee interviews. The other thing that we learn, um, you know, shortly after that in 2003, this... Um, list here, this document that I have a picture of, it's called The Golden Chain. You can read an article about it in the, in the Wall Street Journal. Um, this is seized uh, by US intelligence forces, and it's a list of early donors to Al Qaeda. That to me was really telling because the early donors were not, you know, we in those days people were saying, well, terrorists are poor, terrorists are uneducated, they don't have any other options, so they join these terrorist groups. And if you look at the three who started Al Qaeda, this is not true highly educated and very wealthy and had lots of alternatives for, I mean, Bin Laden could have spent his life as a playboy in Europe if he wanted to, but he chose this, right? If you look at the people on the, the, the golden chain, they are people who had a lot to lose, business leaders, executives, clerics, a wide range of people. Again, that's the demand curve, right? We're thinking about who wants terrorism and why. So in the early days for Al Qaeda to be effective, they operated very much as a paramilitary bureau. The top gave directions to the cells. So we understood that it was a cell-like arrangement and the cells were small, maybe no more than 11 people. 
and they were isolated from their families, but from each other. And this was the way to get the attacks to be successful in the long run. Today, Al Qaeda is much different. It's more of a franchise where lots of groups kind of claiming Al Qaeda. So there's at least 20 loose, loosely affiliated groups. Um, and then kind of here you have kind of the four primary groups. So it's a very different organization. And I think in some sense, in terms of transnational terrorism, it's, it's different than what it was at the early days. And I think some of that probably as well is related to uh, bin Laden's death. But here's, here's kind of the economics, and then I'm going to stop in a minute so we have time for questions. If you look at this graph, this is from Our World in Data, which is a great resource for lots of different types of data that you might want to see. If you look at you know, terrorism fatalities by region, this is a global problem that has gotten worse since 9-11. And so again, the economist goes in and says, okay, well, why is that? Why, when we're fighting terrorism so explicitly since 9-11, why is terrorism getting worse? Now, this is just a surface level correlation, but that surface level cor correlation should motivate the economist who has eyes wide open to kind of investigate what, what is going on, right? Because the economists might, well, will say, the good economists, I think, will say, what are the costs? What are the benefits and what are the alternatives? Those are the three questions economists always ask when we do anything, whether it's the war on terrorism or choosing where you're going to eat lunch, right? Some of those uh, decisions are much more consequential than others. What are the alternatives? What are the costs? What are the benefits? And so when you look at the war on terror, which is the U.S. response to terrorism after the 9-11 attacks, there was a kind of a full frontal assault on terrorism. And um, I just looked this up. The war on terrorism by 2018, $6 trillion spent. I, I kind of found some uh, more updated data too as well. The Pentagon since 2011 has spent $14 trillion, half of which have gone to defense contractors in the form of private companies. And so we've changed the incentives about why we go to war. And we've created a class of beneficiaries, people who work for these corporations and for these government agencies who have jobs and they get paid good salaries to fight the war on terrorism. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But I think the problem is, is that it might alter the incentives in addition to some of the civil liberties that a lot of economists and others are worried about. Um, so some of the things that are packaged into the Patriot Act, you know, um, roving wiretaps that, and there's been lots of conversations about this, right? So at what cost, at what length are we willing to suspend civil liberties and are we willing to suspend economic freedom to fight terrorism? And so public choice is a discipline of economics that kind of tries to really understand these types of coalitions that form between the market sphere and the government sphere. And I did a little research and these are the five, the top five beneficiaries of um, defense contracts related to the war on terrorism. And the numbers underneath are the most recent numbers I could find, I think it's from 2020, on their um, year annual receipts. So Lockheed Martin got $36 billion alone. So there's people at Lockheed and Raytheon and all these places that are becoming very rich because we're you know, continue to be engaged in a war on terrorism. Just to give a comparison, I added all of this up. There's about 90 billion, and that's about similar to the entire GDP of Ecuador. So all I'm saying here, I mean, obviously the US total GDP is much higher than the Ecuador, Ecuadorian GDP, but the point is these resources have opportunity costs. And so the economist is always kind of nagging, right? Pushing to help us assess, is this still the right thing to do? Maybe it was the right thing to do in 2001, maybe not, but is it still the right thing to do? Is it still worth this huge financial outlay that means Americans can do less with that money, right? They have to choose because scarcity applies to what the government does as well as to what other people do. And so the unintended consequences are here. I think this is another graph. This is from the Global Terrorism Index, which is an extremely helpful resource. And if you look at the post-2000 era, post-9-11 era, U.S. invades Afghanistan and then Iraq. There's a troop surge. The Syrian civil war begins. Um, and so you have kind of conflict in these countries that has grown over time. So Nigeria really didn't have a significant terrorism problem 25 years ago. Again, so that might be an unintended consequence of 
the U.S. and others' response. So this is not just me saying, you know, the U.S. government has done a terrible job. That's not the message that I want to have be heard here. But I think it's, we have to use economics to parse out what is the benefit we're getting from spending these resources and how do we know when it might be time to say, let's do it another way, right? And let's not create special interest groups that are gonna push to have perpetual war even if the war isn't effective because there's real cost to war. It is truly the most expensive thing you can do as, a, as an act of government. It's the most, it's the bloodiest, most expensive thing you can do. And so we want to find out if there are other ways. And sometimes maybe there are not, but I think <clears throat> we want to look at that. So um, I already talked about that. Here's the last thing I'm going to talk about. This comes from Bob Higgs, um, who's written a lot on public choice. And he calls this phenomenon not just with respect to 9-11, but he talks about the ratchet effect. And the ratchet effect deals with crises. Whenever we have a crisis, it could be 9-11, it could be the Great Recession, it could be what we just have been through, COVID, and there's a ratchet effect for COVID. And so if you look at point A to B here, A to B is the pre-crisis levels of government growth. Note that they're increasing. So the assumption is government always grows, which is true empirically. And then B is the crisis. So from B to C, you get this huge shock, huge increase in government spending. C to D is the leveling out. D to E is the drawback and E to F. So the ratchet effect suggests that every time we have a crisis and we have a government response to the crisis, we get this ratchet effect, which is a permanent increase in the size and scope of government. It never fully goes back down to pre-crisis levels. And if we're worried about fiscal responsibility and budgets and all these types of things, I just think that's something we have to consider. So again, last comment here is that none of this means everything the US did was wrong. None of this means we should do nothing. It means that the economic way of thinking helps us kind of critique and find alternatives. So thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I think give it back to Roger. Well, thank you, Anne. That was extremely thought provoking and insightful. I'm sure it's gonna generate a lot of questions. Uh, Jennifer Stanglin will handle those. She'll correct me if I'm wrong, but questions should go in the Q and A and uh, Jen will field as many as we can in our remaining time. So uh, take it away, Jen, and thank you, Anne, for that those insights. Great, thank you, Roger. Luckily, I won't actually be fielding the questions. That will be Dr. Bradley's job, but um, we will be selecting questions from the Q&A. So um, please go ahead and submit any questions that you have there. We do have a question from Spencer Doherty um, asks, how can private sectors partner with government to fight terrorism in a healthy, long-term focused relationship? This is, I think this is the $64 million question. And so unfortunately what my, my answer might be unsatisfying because I don't always know exactly how we get there, but I think what we have to do is disentangle special interest groups from the funding. So it's not ridiculous, right? To kind of claim that the government might need to purchase things from the private sector, whether that's even consulting services or actual physical resources. So the example I always give my students is the CIA doesn't make its own pencils, right? This is like a distortion of their comparative advantage. They need to buy pencils, but you know, like we're not really worried about the pencils, right? We're worried about other things. So there's obviously outsourcing that's required. And I think um, the way that we think about or that the government thinks about rebidding these contracts year to year um, is important. The problem is that some of these organizations are so large that it's like by their size, they're the ones that get selected to engage in these huge contracts. So it's kind of like this vicious cycle. Um, I also think just thinking about proxies that we use to understand firm efficacy in the real world. So profit and loss, right? The problem with government agencies is governments maximize budgets and firms maximize profit. And to maximize a budget, so like the TSA, for example, right? They have to spend all their money to get more money for the next year. So this creates terrible incentives for productivity and efficiency because your goal is to just get, you have to guess, which entrepreneurs guess all the time. They don't know how much inventory to have. They have to learn that, right? But the profit and loss mechanism makes them get it right more often, you know, or get that closer to right. Whereas the TSA, and I'm just not picking on the TSA, any government agency, they just ask Congress for a number. And there's a lot of research that goes into that number, but it's arbitrary, right? And so the problem is public-private partnerships. I don't really like that phrase, it worries me, because I think what it does 
is it insulates firm against the loss. And so maybe there's a way to think about contracts that maybe they can only be one year and then maybe you can't renew for another year. So you don't have this perpetual endowment from the federal government uh, because that is going to absolutely impact what you lobby for, right? Um, it's going to, you're, you're going to say, look, there's all these threats. We need to be involved. Give us another 36 billion. And I think over time, not only is there a moral hazard in terms of the war on terrorism, but there's just a fiscal problem with the government not being able to do that, right? Without, you know, because the huge opportunity costs. So those are some of my initial thoughts. How you put those into practice is a challenge. Thank you, Anne. Um, we have another question from Amanda Lawrence. Um, she asks, on the world and data chart, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean are high. Are cartels considered terrorist organizations? So they can be. Again, I think this is where there's a real challenge. Um, I think the danger is calling everything we don't like a terrorist group. So, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a drug cartel in my city, not sponsored by a federal government, that shoots people when they don't pay for their drugs, right? Like this is bad behavior and terrible and violent, but I don't think it falls under terrorism. So one of the more important elements of how we categorize who is a terrorist and who isn't is, is terrorists have a broader objective, right? The drug cartel obviously wants you to buy their drugs and is going to punish you if you don't pay them or come, you know, kind of live into their terms. Um, but the terrorist is a little bit broader and that's why more problematic because terrorists target non-combatants. So to answer your question, I think that cartels can be terrorist groups, but I don't think they necessarily are. So I think we would have to look at what's going on in those countries in particular, right? Especially kind of in the seventies and eighties and say, so in that sense, you could say, well, we had an organization that used to be a terrorist group, but it's not anymore. It's become legitimized. It's become a political party, right? And so they're nonviolent. They, they want social change still, but they're not using violence again against non-combatants, right? So the terrorist groups are indiscriminate in terms of their tar target. Why? Because it makes people afraid of them. And they want governments to respond to that, right? Which is why 9-11 was executed in the way it was. It's you're gonna kill a bunch of innocent people. You hate the US government and everything it stands for. And you wanna kind of drop people to their knees to respond to what you just say you want. So I think the answer is sometimes. I, it, it's much more dependent on what they're doing and why. And so we would just look at each as a case study to ascertain whether we think it fits. Good question. Um, another question for you, Anne. Um, in your opinion, I, according to that same world and data chart where we saw the spike in terrorism in the recent decades, um, what are the current economic factors, in your opinion, on why terrorism is spiking? Well, I think there's a lot that goes into this. Um, so one, I think, is, you know, I, I think that having U.S. troops and again, sometimes it's necessary, so I'm careful about how I answer this question. But essentially, so for example, I think I, I read recently that the US has engaged in 76 drone attacks in Yemen, which is kind of de facto being at war in Yemen. And you know whether that's the right thing to do with respect to what's going on in Yemen, I think is maybe a different question, but here's the problem. If, if one government was persistently dropping drones in your country, how would you respond to that? Would you say, you're right, we need to stop what we're doing, or would that anger you? So I think sometimes the response to terrorism in the past 20 years actually leads to kind of anti-US um, sentiment in those countries and combined with other economic factors, right? So it's very true, and I didn't, um, Maybe, is it okay, Jen, if I just share my screen for one second? Please go uh, ahead. Okay, so I, I didn't get to this, but let's see if I can do it fast. Okay, yeah, it was the next to last slide. So what I tried to do is I went to the Economic Freedom of the World Report and or the Economic Freedom Index, and basically this kind of allows us to give countries a score on zero to 10. And so then what I did is I, I went to the Global Terrorism Database and I found the countries that are 
most active in terms of terrorist groups. So here are the countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Syria, Yemen, Pakistan, India. And then I looked at their economic freedom scores and they're all in the mostly unfree category. So that was just one way for me, it's a correlation, right? It's not regression or a causal analysis, but what I think is important there is it tells us something institutionally about what might be going on, right? So that gives us a way to look at the economic indicators, but it's not just, what I want people not to do is say, well, poor countries, um, that's, you know, they're poor, so they don't have any other options. Actually, terrorists are paid well and their families are compensated. And more importantly, they're given a sense of community. They're given a sense of belonging in the group. And this is a phenomenon that economists have kind of clubs and things like this that economists have understood matter psycho you know, psychologically for us for a long time. So I think it's not, I guess what I'm saying is most important. It's not just one thing, but I think it's the brokenness of institutions. Here's the other thing that I think is interesting. I think countries that are run through militant authoritarian theocracies are vulnerable to lots of problems, but I go back to Tocqueville on this point. Tocqueville, when he wrote Democracy in America, one of his, I think, most important observations was that when Americans have a problem, they solve it themselves in their communities, right? He, he talked, he saw these voluntary associations. And one of my favorite lines is he says, when the French have a problem, they go to the government. When the Americans have a problem, they form an organization and they solve it. And he thought that that was a really important buffer, an insulator about against an authoritarian state. So in a place that's, you know, run in, a, in an authoritarian way where there's not that separate civil society, where there's not insulated market activity, and where there's not a system of legitimate government where people can openly express grievances against the government, I think this is more likely to be a place where terrorists are happy to organize and more likely to be able to raise money. Um, and so I think all of that stuff really, really matters a lot. Good question. I could talk about that all day. Sorry. No, it's okay. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this question is from Nellie. Um, asks, have you considered investigating the phenomenon of economics of terrorism in the context of current world events? If so, how, specifically how economic sanctions help curb the incentives for states supporting terrorism? Yeah, there's this is a great question, Molly, and I think sanctions are tough. Um, sanctions are tough because there's a lot of literature, uh, economics literature, about the efficacy of sanctions. And one thing we seem to know for sure, um, just the short summary, is that sanctions work much better on your friends than your enemies. And I just think about, you know, think about middle school, right? <laughs> if you say you're not going to talk to your friend, you know, that's that's punitive, that and it matters, it hurts. But saying you're not long, you know, no longer going to talk to somebody you didn't really talk to in the first place is not as punitive. And so, the the, the sanctions that we want to enact typically um, that we're most worried about are not on Canada, right? Our friends. Um, it's on countries that we are worried about. We have hostile relations with. We're at a state of war with. And so, I think sanctions. Um, I'm not sure the efficacy of them in ultimately. Um, rolling back the demand for terrorism, because that's how I always want to kind of stop and think about it that way, right? It's why are people showing up to be terrorists? If people stop showing up, terrorists will just become lone wolves and they won't be very effective. You're never going to get terrorism to go to zero. I something I should have said earlier, right? So that can't even be our political goal. Um, but lessening it, I think, is an important goal. So I think sanctions occasionally are a tool that we can use, but as it pertains to terrorists, those countries usually don't fit into the category of things that we're looking for to have sanctions be effective. Um, so I, I know we have to go in a second, but I just read this morning that Putin's Russia is exporting more oil now than it was before the invasion. And kind of the one quick takeaway from that is the sanctions from the US have not been that effective, right? Because they're just gonna sell it to other people. And so, United sanctions are even hard. So a lot of times we'll say, well, the response to that is let's get a lot of countries to sanction a country together, but that's very hard to withhold those agreements and make them binding. So I just think there are other ways um, in our kind of bag of, of, tr of tricks in terms of statecraft and policy that we can think about. But one of the unsung heroes here to me is economic freedom. How do we advance economic freedom across the world? Because ultimately at the end of the day, when you live in a rich country with lots of choice, a, a, you know, a country that protects human dignity through the law, rule of law, 
that you're much like you're not going to get zero, but you're much much like less likely to get terrorist havens because the cost is too high, right? So very few people are going to do that. So I think that's ultimately the answer. But how you get there, I think, is a matter of policy and other things. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bradley. Uh, we want to thank her for coming to speak to us and, and share your depth of knowledge today. Um, thank you to all of our alumni and students who have joined us today. Um, we're so happy that you're here. Um, and be reminded, this is a part of our virtual event series. Um, so alumni, please be looking on Alumni Connect for the next virtual event, which will be taking place in the fall. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely day.